Vanadium redox flow batteries are stepping into the spotlight, and not quietly. One of the largest battery energy storage systems, BSS in the world, just came online in China, and it's a vanadium redox flow battery. Even bigger ones are on the horizon with a massive system under construction in Switzerland. More are in development in countries like Australia, Morocco, and Belgium. But it makes you wonder, why now? And why are they suddenly everywhere, except in North America? So what exactly is a vanadium redox flow battery, or VRFB? Imagine a battery that plays perfectly with solar and wind energy, scales effortlessly to industrial levels, and doesn't degrade like lithium-ion cells. Some models are even small enough to fit in your garage, though most are built for grid-level power. What makes them different isn't just their chemistry, it's their design. Unlike conventional batteries, which store energy in solid materials, VRFBs use liquid electrolytes. This makes them uniquely scalable, stable, and long-lasting. Need more energy? Just increase the size of the tanks. Want more power? Upgrade the stack. It's modular and remarkably simple. No other battery technology makes scaling so straightforward. Take Japan's 51 megawatt facility in Hokkaido, built in 2022. At the time, it was the largest VRFB system in the world, but it didn't hold that title for long. By late 2024, China's Rongke Power introduced the 175 megawatt, 700 megawatt hour Xinjiang Energy Storage Project, currently the largest redox flow battery system ever built. And that's still not the end of the story. A new behemoth is taking shape in Laufenburg, Switzerland. There, a 500 megawatt, 1.2 gigawatt hours VRFB system is being built to support a high demand telecom data center. That's double the size of the Xinjiang project. If completed on schedule, it will become the new global benchmark for flow battery capacity. So how did we get from lab prototypes to world record installations? Let's rewind. The idea of flow batteries isn't new. In fact, the concept dates back to the 19th century, with the first patent for a zinc flow battery filed in 1879. But these early designs were never commercialized. Material science just wasn't there yet. Even NASA's early experiments in the 1970s failed to produce viable systems due to membrane limitations and poor electrolyte performance. It wasn't until the 1980s that real progress was made. Researchers at the University of New South Wales in Australia pioneered a new approach, dissolving vanadium in sulfuric acid to act as an electrolyte. Why vanadium? Because it's one of the rare elements with four stable oxidation states, allowing it to be used on both sides of the battery. This eliminates cross-contamination, a common failure point in other flow battery chemistries. That was a breakthrough. The university patented the technology and licensed it to a few startups. But like many promising technologies, it stayed under the radar. Then something changed. In 2006, several key patents expired. This opened the floodgates for public and private R&D. That same year, the U.S. Department of Energy's Pacific Northwest National Laboratory launched its own VRFB development program. By 2012, they had formulated a new, more powerful vanadium electrolyte, twice as effective as previous versions. Now, with solar and wind expanding rapidly, the demand for energy storage soared, and VRFBs were ready. Ronke Power seized the moment. Their Xinjiang project isn't just large, it's strategic. China aims to dominate the renewable energy sector, but wind and solar are intermittent. Without reliable storage, their benefits can't be fully realized. That's where VRFBS come in. And they're not stopping there. Ronke has developed a 100 megawatt to 400 megawatt hour system, and in 2024, their Dalian facility became the first vanadium redox battery system to complete a black start. That's when a power station restarts itself after a total grid outage. It's a major stress test, and VRFBs passed it. Japan, too, is taking notice. In Windrich, Hokkaido, the electric utility HEPCO partnered with Sumitomo Electric to build a 51 megawatt system using 130 tanks filled with 10,000 gallons of vanadium solution each. It powers 27,000 homes for four hours and is designed to be expanded in the future to support eight to 10 hour durations. 
That's crucial for storing solar power overnight or for bridging gaps in wind production. The success of Hokkaido led Sumitomo to export its VRFB systems to Morocco, Belgium, Australia, and even California. Let's return to Switzerland, where telecom firm Flexbase is building a data center that spans 20,000 square meters. Data centers are notorious power hogs, so Flexbase is going green with a twist, building its own renewable energy supply and storage. Its 500 megawatts to 1.2 gigawatt hours VRFB will be paired with 8,400 square meters of solar panels. The system will also reuse its waste heat to supply Laufenberg's district heating network. Why Laufenberg? It's a strategically located town near the historical junction of Germany, France, and Switzerland's power grids. Though the original network node was decommissioned in 1958, the site remains central for European electricity distribution. Flexbase is reviving its relevance with state-of-the-art green energy. But not every story has a happy ending. In early 2024, Horizon announced it would test Redflow's zinc bromide battery in a large-scale system. But by October, Redflow had gone bankrupt. It's a sobering reminder. No matter how good the tech is, clean energy is still a tough business. So why do VRFBs work so well for grid storage? It comes down to a few key advantages. First, scalability. Most batteries link power output and storage together. You double one, you double both. But with VRFBs, energy and power are independent. Want to store more? Add tank volume. Want more power? Add more stacks. That's flexibility. Second, safety. Vanadium electrolyte is non-flammable and stable in extreme temperatures. That makes VRFBs perfect for wildfire-prone or freezing environments. They can sit unused for months without degrading, and their expected life is 15,000 to 20,000 charge cycles, roughly five times more than lithium-ion batteries. Sumitomo claims a 20-year lifespan for their units, with minimal maintenance. Then there's the cost. VRFBs have a lower levelized cost of energy, LCOE, over time than lithium systems, especially at scale. When a VRFB reaches end of life, up to 97% of the vanadium can be recovered and reused. Sumitomo has already done this successfully, reprocessing vanadium from a retired system into a new one that's still operating today. Of course, there are trade-offs. VRFBs are large. That's fine for power plants or industrial use, but not for EVs or smartphones. Their round-trip efficiency also drops at large scale. While small cells hit 85 to 90 percent, larger setups operate at 57 to 75 percent due to fluid dynamics and energy loss in pumps and shunt currents. Then there's supply. Vanadium is mostly extracted as a byproduct of steelmaking, with 75 percent coming from just 10 mills in China and Russia. The US and Australia produce some, but not nearly enough. If we want to build large VRFB facilities, we'll need new vanadium sources or more effective recycling programs. And finally, the upfront cost. Vanadium is twice as expensive as lithium. Though the cost is offset by long-term durability, the initial investment is high, and that scares some investors. Especially in North America, where market volatility makes energy companies risk-averse. That's why some are exploring alternatives like zinc bromide or hydrogen bromide flow batteries. They don't have vanadium's multivalence trick, but they bring their own strengths. Still, no chemistry is perfect, and the jury's still out on what will dominate. So where does that leave us? Vanadium redox flow batteries are no longer experimental. They're working, they're expanding, they're proving their value on a global scale. With strong lifespan, scalable architecture, and competitive costs over time, VRFBs are ready for prime time. But we need to be realistic. Not every project will succeed, not every facility will get built, and not every region will adopt VRFBs equally. That said, the early full-scale successes in China, Japan, and Switzerland offer something rare in energy tech. Real-world proof. If the industry can solve vanadium supply issues and reduce costs, VRFBs could become a pillar of the global renewable energy grid. And just maybe, just maybe, 
that strange little metal from a 19th century patent could power the 21st century's biggest green revolution.